Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to Unedited Edits. Unedited Edits. Ooh. If you're new to this series, it's where I take a deeper look into some of the videos that I've created, um, sharing some of my insights into why I made some of the decisions that I did and some of the hows within DaVinci Resolve for creating certain looks, effects, that sort of thing. And we're gonna get right into that, but I wanted to say two things real quick. One, we recently hit uh, 10,000 subscribers on this channel, which is, I don't know, that's really cool. I, <laughs> it's kind of, I, I know for a lot of people, it's 10,000 isn't that big of a number, but um, for me, that is very, very surreal. Um, when I first started putting out some of these videos and some of the shorts, I remember being pretty jazzed to hit 100 subscribers, and then we pushed past past a thousand and now we're at <clears throat> 10,000 subscribers. Sorry, my voice is also, I'm recovering from like a little cold, so sorry the voice is kind of off, but um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I'm humbled. The second thing I wanted to say is that these videos, the unedited edits, um, I'm probably going to move over to my Ko-Fi page. What my goal is to do with that page is I'm going to, I'm gonna do my best to start putting out assets for you guys to use. And what I mean by that is like um, title packs for you guys to use, text packs for captioning, and if I develop any effects of my own, they'll live there. And my plan is to have that be a space where I can provide some things for you guys. And then if you would like to support me, you can do that as well. Um, and right now, I, I enjoy doing the unedited edits videos, but there's not, it, it's this channel and kind of direction I like to take it. It's not the best spot for these to live, but I know a lot of people find value in that. So I don't know, we'll see, we'll feel it out. But that's kind of my plan for right now. Again, thank you guys for the 10,000 subscribers and uh, let's get into the video. So here's what we got going on today. I have two short form videos that I edited recently for Zach or exact. Uh, he's the guy who I work for primarily and what I wanted to do is like a little breakdown of each. I'm not gonna cover the entire video, but a lot of times when you watch tutorials on YouTube, they're not always like applicable to what you're working on. So, and then yeah, we can talk about some areas that I feel like I could improve on myself because there are still a lot of things that I'm working on and trying to get better at. So let's go ahead and hop into it. So the first video that we're gonna take a look at, I called Take Me Back to Verdansk and it's a, montage type of video that incorporates a lot of b-roll from call of duty trailers and some old clips from zach and it has like a nostalgic feel paying homage to verdansk and if you never played warzone verdansk is one of the older maps in the game and a lot of people miss that map so so we tried to make a video with some nostalgic vibes to it and there were a couple of things that i felt like i did that were kind of cool kind of fun uh, so let's talk about it so we're in DaVinci now and I have my audio muted because for both of these videos that I'm talking about, uh, they do not use YouTube friendly music. So one of the cooler shots that I feel like we did was this in-between sequence of the weapon slowing down into a sprint animation and then overlaying some nostalgic footage behind it. This is a um, the sequence that I'm talking about right here. So let's talk about the motivation leading into this. There's some B-roll footage and we transition into some of Zach's gameplay. And there's a section here in the song and I'm gonna go ahead and play it and hopefully YouTube doesn't flag it. That section of the song, there's a little more energy in the vocals and so I felt like it would be cool to accentuate the song there and show some visuals before going into the ending part of the clip. So. To do that, we've got two clips we're working with. We have the background footage and the foreground. The foreground is the actual character animation from the in-game clip, and the background is going to be uh, Ghost, the uh, Call of Duty character, Ghost. And it's got this, like, okay, so here we go. So the background footage is actually taken from this Call of Duty trailer um, that I ripped from their YouTube channel, and it looks like that. So what I did is I imported that footage here, and then we have this like, um, almost like a mosaic film reel kind of look. And in DaVinci, it's, it's not too bad to make, but you are gonna have to use the Fusion page to do it. 
All right, so now we're in the Fusion page for this uh, background footage. And what I'm gonna go ahead and do, if you're not familiar with the Fusion page, is I'm going to just cycle through our node tree. You'll notice that wherever this little white dot is on the node tree, the node layout, the node flowchart, whatever you wanna call it, that's what's being displayed in our preview window. So if I go over to the beginning and hit two, you'll see we're with our, we start, excuse me, you'll see we have the original footage that's pulled from this uh, Call of Duty trailer. So that's the sequence right in here. Um, I think what I was originally trying to do was create some kind of like dreamy looking background and then I ended up settling on this film roll look. So um, I don't know if these are necessarily something that you would have to have in order to do a look like this. Excuse me. Um, but I added some waviness. It's very subtle. You can see that it's... Um, it's pretty subtle, just adds a little uh, distortion to the footage. And then we add some motion blur here to just soften it a little bit. One of the things that I've learned when it comes to framing things in shots, and I'm still learning and figuring it out, is when you're separating things in your foreground and background, there's a lot of ways to do it, either with the colors or the contrast of the footage. And one of the ways you can contrast foreground to background is just focus. So if I make something in the foreground sharper than it is in the background, then it's easier for me to focus on the thing in the foreground than it is in the background. So that's what I did with the motion blur. But the real key to this effect is this analog damage. And I believe the analog damage comes in every version of DaVinci. Y'all can correct me if I'm wrong if it's not available in the free version. But essentially what the analog damage does is create this um, film looking effect. Well, let's see if we can't recreate this effect. So if I go and create a new analog damage node, this is what it looks like by default, but I kind of like the layering of the ghost faces. I, I almost wanted like a, like a tile kind of background, but um, let's see. Yeah, let's see if we can't recreate that. So once you're in your analog damage node, there's a ton of different settings that you can play with. The ones that we're going to be messing with are the scan settings primarily and what these settings do are essentially size and position your your footage if you will so i'm going to go ahead and decrease the image aspect a little bit that gives us our ghost character and if i increase the overscan, that's going to zoom in for us so we might need to increase our size Go ahead and shift it over a little so that ghost face is in the middle. <sighs> and I think I increased our vertical scale to be bigger than the normal default so that it took up the entire screen. I gotta bring you down just a little bit. And there you go. That's, I mean, that's pretty close to the original shot. So now that we have that, we have our background set up and let's talk about this foreground look so i guess the first question is how did we isolate the gun and you'll notice that if i were to pause our particular frame and zoom in that our actual like masking and roto work isn't that great but because this sequence is less than a second long uh it, it really doesn't matter that much and that that it itself is just for fun you know it's not we're not presenting at like the toronto film festival so it doesn't matter too too much but how did we isolate the gun and hand motion as they're flying up. Well, um, there's a few ways you can do it. I'm gonna talk about the way that I did it and then I'll talk about some other options that you can use if you're trying to mask out a weapon or something for your gaming footage. Um, if I zoom in on my timeline, you'll see that this actually has the tag render next to it. And that's because I actually rendered out the masked Footage. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a copy of this, I'm going to disable the original, and then I'm going to right click on my render and hit decompose to original. And now we have our original footage, our uh, clip that we're working with. So let's go into the Fusion page for our original footage. All right, so we're in the Fusion page with our original footage and You'll notice a few things that are an issue here and why our mask doesn't look so great. So, um, one, if I zoom in on the footage, this is a Twitch clip. 
and so the resolution i believe it's like maybe 480p at best it, the quality is really low so um that's always an issue when you're trying to isolate something in your your media i guess and the other issue that made this particular clip difficult to work with is that the contrast from the gun to the background is not a lot when it comes to masking or doing roto work a lot of times it's easier to pick stuff out when there's like a clear distinction in the background so if i were to hold something up to the sky there's an easy separation between what's going on so the tool that i used is da vinci's magic mask and before all my free users freak out we can talk about some other ways you can go about doing this but just bear with me um the way the magic mask works is that you will go to a certain area and draw a line over where you'd like the footage to be masked out, essentially. And DaVinci will do its best to figure out, okay, within that area, which groups of pixels look like they belong together. But like I said, it's really hard for that for DaVinci to figure this out. So what I had done originally is I had added a contrast node here. And you notice it's not there anymore because I removed it. But if I go to this contrast node and I increase the contrast and I play around with our sliders a little bit. Obviously, this isn't a great final look, but you can see how much easier it is for us to pick out the hand and the weapon sliding up and down. Is it perfect? No. Is it better? Definitely. So, so that's a tip that I had found a while ago watching some YouTube videos is to play with the contrast a bit before you go into doing some masking work. So I had originally added a contrast node and then I had done our magic mask. And essentially the way the magic mask works is you're going to draw lines on areas that you would like to keep and draw red lines on areas that you don't want to keep. And so I'm going to go ahead and go through that process again for you guys. Let me go ahead and reset this. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to toggle my preview display back to the brightness node, because if I start drawing lines on the magic mask, I'll lose some of the other areas that I'd like to keep. So what I'm going to do is actually tinker with this just a little bit more. So we get a little more separation and um, I'm going to pick a frame where both are as clear as can be. And you can see as I scrub through this, like how bad some of this footage ends up looking. So uh, this frame right here looks pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and add a blue line somewhere in here. Like that. Then I'm going to try to get the gun animation as well now if i toggle back over to my magic mask you can see that it has been a pretty good job of just isolating those areas i'm gonna do a couple things first i'm gonna change the mode from faster to better it's gonna be a little more computational heavy but you can see that Switching back and forth between the two, we get a closer outline to the shapes that we're trying to get. But you'll notice we have these two areas in the middle here, or excuse me, but you'll notice we have this area in the middle here that we don't want to keep. You can either go over to the subtract mode and the inspector panel, or you can just hold down the alt key and draw in here. And that's, I mean, that's pretty good for what we want. Again, this section is going to be so fast that it doesn't necessarily matter how clean this is if this was something that was going to span like a few seconds or even longer than that then we might pay closer attention to it but this is good for now and then all i'm going to do is go over to the track forward and reverse let davinci do its thing perfect so um yeah again it's <laughs> it's not great but again it it really doesn't matter if there is an area that you feel like you would like to add to da vinci or you would like to add to your magic mask so like in here maybe i want to try to bring that hand back right um i'm going to toggle back over to the brightness node select my magic mask and let's see if we can't i don't well, i don't know if it's gonna be able to pick it up we might just have to yeah i don't know 
but that would be um that would be how you could add some areas and then we would just need to retract forward there we go okay so now that we have a, a rough mask of what we're looking for i'm gonna go ahead and delete our bright brightness and contrast node and it's going to keep the same pixels that we've already masked out so if i scrub through here we still have our, our gun animation um and then what i did is i used the erode and dilate node if anybody's made it this far in the video and has a better solution to this problem i would love to know but i often work with footage that isn't necessarily super sharp and I don't know of a better way to smooth out that footage than to use the erode and dilate node. And, and essentially what it's going to do is expand and contract your footage to give you a smoother outline of what you're going for. The only thing I changed here is that by default it's on box. I changed it to circle. You could also do Gaussian. That might work as well. But yeah, that looks pretty good as well. We do Gaussian, and then whenever I'm working with masked footage in DaVinci, because the Magic Mask node takes up so much memory, what I'll often do is I will add a green screen background to it. This is useful because one, you can start to see some areas that could use some refining. So if I maybe go back to my erode and dilate, go back to circle, yeah. And that actually looks a little bit better. I can fine tune some of the um, the masking settings. And so I can even go into my magic mask and go to the matte settings. And you'll see it has an erode and dilate feature here as well that you can use for just the mask in itself. So if I wanted to, I could add a little uh, feathering to the edge, a little blur to our mask. But the main reason I'll add this green background is because we're gonna do what I had mentioned earlier and I'm going to render this fusion clip. Because the magic mask takes up so much memory and oftentimes if you go back and play the footage like the next day, sometimes the um, you'll have to restore the cache and you will lose your tracking. So to avoid that issue altogether, I'll add a green background. And then what I'll do is I will render out this clip and get a let me re enable our original and then what i'll do is i will bring our rendered footage which is here right this is our original footage that we had rendered and i will just key out the green and the way i did that was using the ultra keyer and i believe I just selected the uh, the green background and it looks like it's not all the way green, which is kind of interesting. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so then we keyed out our green background. The only other thing that we did for this footage to give this cool glow tracer effect is I actually use Dax's Spider-Verse effect. Um, I'll leave a link to his channel and that effect because it's really cool. It's really nifty. He walks you through how to make this look and even how to create your own preset so that you can uh, change and tweak with some of the settings yourself. So that's what I did. I created or I brought in his plugin, his macro, and I tweaked some things on it. And that's how you get this tracer effect. And then that's essentially it. So we have the mass out gun with the motion trails. We have ghosts in the background and then it looks like this. Pretty cool. Now, what if you don't have the studio version of DaVinci and you can't use Magic Mask? Well, there's gonna be a few options. Uh, you could use the color page and try to use like the qualifier tool or some of the different tools in there and then create an Apple, and not an Apple, an alpha channel to mask out that effect. I did a tutorial on masking with like a door transition. So you can check that out if you're interested in the color page. Um, what you could also do is some hand rotoing in DaVinci. So you could take your polygon tool and try to trace over and draw around whatever shape you're trying to mask frame by frame. It's a pretty time consuming process. You can get pretty accurate results. And honestly, I probably could have done that for this clip because um, I'm only working with one, 
I'm only working with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven frames. So it wouldn't be too painful. But what if you're working with something again that's like a second long or two second long and we're in like the 60 frame per second realm. So that could be like 120 times you got to mask something out. There are going to be other keying tools that you can use within DaVinci. And if you pull up your fusion menu, start typing in key, you can see what some of those are. You can try playing around with like some of the different combinations of them. So like you could use the Luma keyer because we're mostly messing with like a black and white and gray footage and try to figure out a way to get like some kind of mask around this area. And then maybe you draw a circle around it to isolate it. But the long story short is that it's probably not going to be super easy unless you're using some kind of automated masking technique. One of the only other options that I can think of, and again, it's gonna be a paid service, is you can use Runway ML. I think they have some kind of like free trial version that you can use to um, test out the website and service, but they'll have a object removing tool and it'll create a green screen background for you to import and mess with again. But yeah, it's masking and doing roto work just in general is a really time consuming process. So uh, no matter what you decide to do, it's gonna take a little bit of time to get the result that you want. Which is why at the end of the day, I'm okay with the result that I got because I really didn't want to spend too much time trying to isolate the exact reason that I was going for. So yeah, uh, this was the final look and the final effect. And I actually applied this principle a couple of different times throughout the video. So I have this shot of this character model running past a flying montage of screenshots of the old map to create this, you know, like running through memories kind of effect. The character model again is pulled from a, a video that Call of Duty made and I used the magic mask tool, isolated her, rendered it out and created a green screen background for it. So I can actually show you what that looks like. Open the fusion page. So if I pulled this up in the fusion page uh, and I decomposed it, you can see that we always, it's the exact same thing. We have a magic mask tool here. We've merged it with the green background node and um, I believe with the mask node, it actually was able to pull a pretty good mask of our running character. And then I just did a couple corrections here in the beginning to remove a couple things that were flipping with the foot. So essentially that's, that's all I did was I used the character model and then the uh, the slideshow effect, I did, I'm not gonna talk about it too long because this is actually like a stock Envato effect. They have like a slideshow preset that you can use. So that's what I did instead of spending like, you know, a day or two creating this montage of pictures. I have a subscription to Envato, I'm gonna use it. So yeah, same kind of effect. Um, I guess I could talk real quick about the pacing of the video um, and whether or not I felt like it worked well or it didn't. So the total video length is uh, just under a minute. So you can see, wow, it's literally just under a minute, 59 seconds or 59, yeah, 59 seconds and 59 frames. And my thought when I was creating the video was to intertwine some really cool cinematics from Verdansk and then also interlace some gameplay from Zach because the video is, I mean, it's his video after all. And the way I did that was I, use some of the opening cinematics and I chose to use the plane animation because that's one of the more like recognizable animations from the game, the plane coming through the cloud. I um, tracked on this text to it. The tracking itself didn't come out that great, but it was serviceable. And then we have this sequential sequence of the plane to dropping out of the plane and then gliding into the game. And so Hopefully what it did is create this op like a immersive sequence that brought you into Verdansk, right? So we're, we're re-gliding into Verdansk. And then you can see that my cuts begin to speed up compared to the opening section here. So we have some three longer cuts and then we have, it's a lot more choppy. And I feel like, I don't know. We might just play the music and <laughs> get this uh, and have some, some good old copyright stuff on the video. But then we go.
this middle section, um, I had a couple of clips from Z that I felt like were pretty, pretty entertaining sections uh, and some cool transitions. So we have the, um, after he hits the snipe shot, we have, we have the MP5 sliding on screen, again, using the same technique that we used with the growl sprinting animation. And then uh, we actually have the next clip with the MP5 cut out drop onto the screen. It's just kind of a fun way to transition to the next scene. Go into this little two piece right here. Cut back to some cinematics. Uh, we go from an RPG cinematic to him getting an RPG. I think this was like a triple kill or quadruple kill. Pretty cool, triple kill. Go into the growl sequence. We continue with some of the gameplay highlights through the verse. And then when it goes into one of the upbeat moments, that's when we do this Verdance run through transition. And the way we transition it is we've masked out our person running across uh, the screen, which is something we already talked about. But if you notice up here in our inspector panel, I actually keyframe its position to walk on screen because if you didn't do that, then the feet would just appear. They would just like boop, pop on screen. It's a little jarring. So we have the character actually run into frame and then there's no more keyframing. It stays in spot while we go through this next sequence. Um, we've got two solid color generators right here and they're just black and they all I'm doing here is I'm having, I'm keyframing the cropping on them. So we have this create this widescreen effect and all that's gonna do is um, force your eyes to focus here on the middle. And I mean, it makes it look a little more cinematic, but I was hoping it just would help you focus. We go back into some gameplay and then I don't know if there's really a whole lot less else to talk about on this clip besides um, the actual look and the grade of the, the clip. So this is probably where DaVinci excels the most when it comes to creating cinematic looks. So if I take this off, and I disable our grade, or yeah, our grade, our color correction, I don't know. Um, you can see everything looks pretty flat and bare. So um, let's go ahead and recreate our, our look for this shot because it is, it's really easy to do. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over to my effects, drag in another adjustment clip and have it expand the length of our sequence right here. And because this top layer is disabled, and our adjustment clip is all the way on the top, I'm just gonna go into color page. And if you've never used the color page, it is definitely intimidating at first, but once you know which sections are gonna be like you friendly and the sections that you need to worry about, it's really easy to use, it's extremely powerful, and you can create some really cool looking things very, very easy. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna mess with our curve. Our, and I, I always call this the contrast curve. I don't know if that's the right word for this, but what we're gonna do is we're going to balance things out so that it's not feeling so flat. This, with especially some of these older clips, you'll notice that they're, they feel pretty washed out. I mean, they're pixelated, but like uh, this section in particular, you can see how gray everything is, Nothing's ever like black or dark. And that reflects here in our curve preview. You can see that the bulk of our colors are uh, almost in like the shadows region and not the black region. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mess with our contrast curve first. So I'm actually just gonna bring down the black point just a little bit so that we're maybe a 10th of the way in. You, you can see just by even doing that, how much richer the frame looks richer, is that a word? I don't know. Better, much better it looks. It is going to make everything a lot darker, but what I often have to do, and a wise man once told me, and Slim, if you're watching, shout out to the boy. He said, if the quality of footage that you're working with isn't great, one of the easiest ways to fix it is to just make everything a little bit darker. You just avoid those, you tend to avoid the issues of like blown out pixels like these. So like see these, red nasty looking pixels and we got like purple stuff going on here. So if when I bring things down and darker, there's a point where you, you can't even see those anymore and it's, um, it's a non-issue. So 
That tends to be one of the solutions that I have when I'm working with bad footage is to do something like that. Um, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create an S curve. And all I'm gonna do with that is I'm gonna create a point in the shadows region, bring that down, create a point in the highlights region, bring it up. And all that's doing is dropping down some of the shadows and increasing some of the highlights. And um, if we do like a little before and after for like area like here, you can see that it's a pretty big difference or even, you know, like even just this like running sequence, much fuller it looks. If you feel like it's too dark, you can always bring this back and then you can go clip by clip and color grade things. But for what I, for the purpose of this video, I didn't feel like it was necessary to do that. Um, so that, that was step one. Uh, step two is to create our grade or the look that we're going for and we went with like a blue orange kind of look and it's really easy to make again in DaVinci. What I'm going to use is the color warper tool and it's going to be right next to our curves. You can use some of the other curves if you'd like. So like the hue versus hue or hue versus saturation um, or you can even use some of the wheels to create this. There's a lot of different ways to do it. The easiest way and the foolproof way of doing this is to go over to the color warper again, right next to the curves. And if you've never used the warper tool before, and the concept is pretty straightforward. You have the different colors laid out on a grid. You can change the grid size with some of these settings over here. Saturation is gonna be going to the edges of the boundary. So if I were to bring in one of our points here, you can see that we're desaturating that area. If I grab one of the endpoints and slide it around, you can see that we changed the hue of that color very easily. Um, I normally work with the endpoints. You can mess around and do some selections of all the points and play around with how they look. Um, but for the purpose of what we're doing here, all I really wanna do is bring in things closer to the orange and like dark blue teal area. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab this far left point, bring this in maybe here, bring down the saturation of our red just a little bit. I'm gonna decrease the saturation of our purples just a little bit, so maybe we're around here. And then I'm gonna slide everything closer to the blues as well. So something like this. And you can play around with this however you'd like, but you'll notice that uh, when we go before to after that our grasses are now a lot more orange. So maybe if we want to retain some of the green, we could bring this uh, node over here and bring it back down. And if I skim through to a different area, a lot of these areas are gonna be a lot more blue. So if I were to reset this in particular and start from the beginning, we start messing around with desaturate the green or let's just shift the green over everything a little more blue get rid of the purple see what that does and again you can play around with this as much as you'd like but this is like a really quick and easy way to create any kind of grade or look something that you're going for if you wanted to fine tune it you could uh, i know a lot of people will Go over to the um, their color wheels and shift the shadows to blue and the highlights to orange. You can do that as well, but this is real straightforward and really easy to do. The only other thing that I did, and it's a really subtle thing, but it's nice to give things like that montage feel. So I'm gonna add a new node, serial, here. And what I'm gonna do is go over to my effects, and I am going to look for the flow effect. And um, if I were to leave this on its default setting, um, I mean, you definitely are getting some, <laughs> some heavy glow, right? Like, woo, that is, um, we got some glow going on. Um, but what I'd like to do is create some kind of like softness with our our footage to give it that like dreamy montage -y kind of look. So one of the first things that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change our composite type to soft light. And you'll notice immediately that we lose a lot of the harshness of the glow. 
I'm going to decrease the spread a little bit. Almost so that the spread is like at zero. Because we don't, we're not trying to create like this big, giant, glowing picture. We just want to add like a little softness to what we got going on. Um, you can leave the horizontal vertical ratio the same. I like to increase the horizontal ratio just a little bit. And then we're going to increase our gain. And this is going to be completely up to you for how much you'd like to increase or decrease, depending on how strong you want this to be. Same with the gamma. Um, the gamma is going to increase some of like the, the spread of it. So um, I might increase the gamma just a little bit as well. And then same with the opacity, like how, how strong do you want this to be applied on? And what we have from before and after is our look. So I'm disabling and enabling our node right here. And um, yeah, we have the, the look that we ended up going with or pretty close to what we had. So yeah, that in essence is the nitty gritty of how we made this first cinematic. If you guys enjoyed this breakdown and actually found it useful i happen to do some more so i had like i have this other clip that i made for zach where we got this cool like comic book looking effect uh we have a bowl <laughs> rising out from behind this building with the sun behind it i'd be happy to cover it just let me know um i hope you guys enjoyed the video and i'll see you all in the next one all right peace